Welcome back to the update. Today we're going to be putting a PC together to run the new season of Fortnite. We have this Dell Precision T3500 and we're going to be marrying it up with this SSD from Kingston. We have two video cards we're going to be running in this system, both that you should be able to pick up at a cheap price. We have this video card that we picked up at the offbit for very cheap and this video card right here that you should be able to pick up on secondhand markets for a reasonable price. So let's go check it out. The Dell T3500 is a workstation computer mainly targeted for CAD and architectural or computer graphic professionals. The T3500 is based on the X58 platform on the LGA1366 socket. This platform gives you a range of top tier CPU options from i7 Xeon and Halem CPUs to the Westmere microarchitecture CPUs. Our system that we purchased for a mere $50 Australian came with 4GB of DDR3 ECC RAM. It also comprises of an Intel Xeon W3520, which is very similar to an i7-920. It also came with a 250GB Western Digital Blue hard drive. And finally, it came with a woeful Quadro FX580. So what do we need to make this machine game ready for Fortnite? Most of the parts in this machine should run Fortnite, except for a couple of items. The video card, and we also would like to change the hard drive, as we feel that this hard drive probably would not be fast enough to give us decent gameplay. But first up, let's boot this machine up and see if she runs. Booting our T3500, we did discover that this machine does have a fresh, unactivated install of Windows 7 which is great because we want to run some stress tests to see if we can find any underlying faults. As you can see here, we're using a trial version of ADA64. With just a simple stress test, we can see we have some cooling issues with our CPU. This is a pretty common occurrence with older systems. As you can see here, once we remove the heatsink, our thermal compound has completely dried up, no longer doing its job. To fix this, it's as simple as removing the old thermal paste from the heatsink and the CPU and reapplying some new thermal paste to either CPU or heatsink. Once we're done, we just place the heatsink back on and screw it back down. This should fix all the overheating problems unless there's some sort of fan issue. Now, if you still want to investigate further with certain parts of the system, you can look at Memtest X86 and test that RAM out. Okay, next thing we're going to do today, we're going to stick in our new drive and we're also going to throw in the Radeon RX 550. The Radeon RX 550 is an AMD GPU that was released back in 2017. This is an entry level gaming card. The card we're using today is from Asus and the variant we're using is the Asus RX 550-4GB-DIS. This card has 4GB of GDDR5 and it's running its GPU at 1183 MHz. This card is a thrifty little card from Asus. With its very uninviting heatsink shroud and its overall dull looks, it makes this card something that most buyers would not even look at. And because of this, this Radeon RX 550, we purchased this from Facebook Marketplace for only $10 Australian. The next thing we're going to do is put our inexpensive 128GB SATA SSD from Kingston. These drives can be bought in Australia generally for about $30. From here we installed the latest version of Windows 10 and we jumped in and checked out CPUID just to see what our specs are. As you can see we've got our Intel Xeon W3520. The W3520 is a 4 core 8 threaded CPU. With 130 watt TDP this thing is quite a hungry sucker. Its core base clock is at 2.6 GHz and can boost up to 2.9 GHz. Now the other video card we're going to be testing in this system is the NVIDIA GTX 560. Now we've looked at the GTX 560 before in previous videos. The GTX 560 is a much older card. It was released on May the 17th of 2011. It is a Fermi based video card and only comes with about 1 gig of GDDR5 RAM. Let's jump into those benchmarks and see what this system can do. In 7-zip, the Xeon W3520 shows a strong multi-core performance, sitting in front most of the CPUs on this benchmark, which it should, since this CPU is basically a 4-core, 8-threaded i7. 
though it was close to the i5-3550, which just shows the strength of the single core performance in the i5-3550. The single core strength from the Xeon W3520 was on par and it was sitting just where it should be. Just sitting shy of the i5-760, another first gen core design CPU from this graph. In CPU ID, CPU Z, our benchmarks had a similar look, but the four core CPUs from the second and third gen i5s did perform better in this benchmark. It is also worth noting that the Xeon X5450, which is a Core 2 quad-based Xeon, did outperform in the single-core benchmark test versus our Xeon W3520. Here, it definitely seems to be a more direct correlation to CPU frequencies with this benchmark and how well it performed. Finally, in Cinebench, the Xeon W3520 did become outperformed by the i5-3550. The W3520 did end up with a respectable score in Cinebench. However, this is a multi-core test and this benchmark really does show that the lower clock speeds on the CPU is definitely punishing its overall performance. It's also worth saying that most games don't take advantage of the high thread core counts. Though newer games are now able to utilize more of these threads, so generally it's better to have higher clock speeds than more cores. Though I do think four to six cores slash threads, in my opinion, is the sweet spot at the moment. However, this is also changing as newer game engines are utilizing more and more threads. In our GPU benchmarks, our two GPUs, the AMD RX 550 and the NVIDIA GTX 560, were both able to produce respectable frame rates with this system. This showing promise once we hit those games. In Unity in Heaven, both GPUs have also returned respectable scores. Interesting to see that the GTX 560 stepped ahead of the AMD RX 550. Our video cards did come close to the GTX 750, however, the GTX 750 in this instance has been combined with a much slower CPU, bottlenecking the true ability of the GTX 750. Finally, in 3D Mark's Firestrike, our RX 550 was the winner between these two cards. Being a newer GPU, its newer and updated techniques and its architecture really do show here. Though the GTX 560 still had a respectable score with this setup. It is also worth noting that the GTX 750 once again showed poor performance with the combination of the Core 2 Quad Xeon. This once again bottlenecking and hiding the true performance of the GTX 750. Now before we get too far into playing Fortnite, let's talk about the setup. We're running the latest version of Windows 10 with the 21H2 update. We've also disabled Windows Defender during gameplay and we also are running the Inspector software to give our CPU just a little bit more performance. This software works by disabling the Spectre and Meltdown microcode updates. The Fortnite settings we ran, we ran the resolution at 920 by 1080 with low details using the beta performance mode for low end computers. The gaming resolution was set at 100% with the draw distance set to medium. We use these settings for both GPUs. First up, the AMD RX 550. The game ran with little hitches, only showing small amounts of load lag. This showing performance that we would describe as being close to flawless, but not perfect. Yes, it may look a bit blocky, and yes, it does look a bit crass on the eyes. But one thing I always love about these types of games and these settings is that the person who has the least amount of detail set on their system can actually see the most. So what am I saying? It is actually much easier to see player models when there's a lot less pretties to distract you. So, let's move on. Let's look at the benchmarks. The benchmarks for our Dell Precision setup married with the AMD RX 550 graphics card are we got an average frame rate of 93.3 frames per second. Our maximum frame rate hit 170.2 and our 0.1% lows were only at 9.3 frames per second. Now these benchmarks reflect just exactly what we saw before. The game was running pretty much close to flawless, with some load lag and a little bit of frame drops here and there. With this setup, you should be able to play Fortnite in Battle Royale mode just fine and you shouldn't have many complaints. Moving on to the GTX 560 playing Fortnite with these settings. The GTX 560 gave us pretty much a very playable experience. We only seem to feel a little bit of load lag here and there and frame rates seem to feel about fine. The benchmarks did somewhat show a little bit of difference, favouring the newer AMD RX 550 card. The benchmarks for the GTX 560 in Fortnite are, we got an average frame rate of 83.7 frames per second, our minimum frame rates hit 33.3 frames per second, and our maximum frame rate had 179.5 frames per second. Our 0.1% lows hit 13.1 frames per second. 
with most of the performance on the card dropping about 10 frames per second across the board. We did see a high 0.1% lows, which is more or less about the same, and this is more of a reflection on the system's performance, more so than the GPU's performance alone. The GTX 560 does deliver good enough gameplay for Fortnite in the competitive format of Battle Royale. Both cards did give us a high average frames per second, leaving us to believe that either of these cards would work for the current iteration of Fortnite and we could recommend using a system just like this in this configuration. To sum it all up, what makes buying a second-hand workstation for a gaming system a good idea? These older X58 based systems like our Dell Precision T3500, other systems like the Lenovo ThinkStation S20s, the HP Z400s, these machines are popping up cheap on second-hand markets everywhere. Now, they are first-gen core design CPUs, but they are all using high-end desktop parts. So, this means that you'll be using an i7 or an i7 equivalent Xeon straight off the bat from purchase, which will give you a capable starting point as a CPU for gaming. This platform also shares the same socket as older servers, making it easy and cheap to upgrade the CPU since second-hand markets at the moment are currently flooded with Xeon CPUs. The platform also supports triple channel memory. This gives better performance over the standard desktop machines and upgrading to 12 gig of RAM can be done on the cheap with 2 gig DDR3 sticks. Overall, with the purchase of a cheap video card and some extra RAM and a CPU upgrade, you could be looking at spending under 150 Australian dollars or about 110 USD. The drawbacks to using a workstation as a gaming rig are newer AAA title games will probably still struggle to run. CPUs cannot be overclocked easily because they are locked by the OEM. Power supply units that fail are not easy to replace, since you cannot just go down to the local shop and just buy a new one. The power draw of the CPUs are in the vicinity of 130 watts. And finally, the aesthetic to these old machines don't attract everyone's taste. With their late noughties bland corporate design aesthetic, it's not everyone's cup of tea. Now we're planning to do some upgrades to this machine in a future video, so keep an eye for that video. Once again, that's all we have today for the Offbit. Thank you for watching and we'd like to thank our Patreon supporters for their contributions. Now if you like this video, feel free to hit that like button. And if you're not a subscriber yet, make sure you hit that subscribe button. Until next time, we'll catch you guys next time on the Offbit.